Okay, guys, I am live now, and I'm going to start sharing some links uh, so that people may get a chance to see what we are discussing here this evening. So just give me a second to do that. Uh, if you have questions, just throw them into the live chat. If you have any questions, just throw them into the live chat right now. I'm just sending out links. So I hope you guys all had a awesome Christmas or whatever it is that you do and that you are looking forward to celebration of the coming year. For those that are in Asia, um, the new year isn't for a few more weeks yet. Uh, but... Uh, Okay, so uh -huh. <laughs> going to be a bit tedious for me whilst I do this. I don't have a multi screen setup here. Um, Uh, da, da, da. No, I can't even find there. <laughs> so we're going to talk about a num number of things. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, potassium carbonate. We're going to be talking about why I uh, put some uh, charcoal, um, milled it up. I called it carbon here, but it's actually charcoal. And I put it into these containers uh, for the tests in Japan and why I will be doing also that in the supernova, hopefully in the next few days. And I want to talk in relation to uh, Matsumoto's work, uh, the work of uh, Alexander Parkamov, and a whole bunch of other things in this chat. So let me find out and get my stuff together here. I have about an hour. Um, so any questions you want answered, uh, throw them into the live chat. Okay, so we've got 11 in the house. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, one of the things that um, was very interesting at ICCF 22, I want to start with this, uh, is uh, leading into ICCF 22, I've been talking a lot with Stoyan, uh, uh, Slobodan uh, Stankovic uh, because he had been watching our work in Japan with uh, Roy Shin Amaza with the Amaza gas and the Amaza vibrator plates. And he had seen some of the things that we were observing, he had seen in his 11 years or so of testing with um, uh, HHO gas uh, with his generators. And uh, one thing he shared with me uh, before that was that he was observing uh, peaks of um, OH radicals. Um, and I did a bit of research on this, and uh, it turns out that OH, uh, you know, it has a microwave resonance. That's why you can heat it up with a microwave um, uh, magnetron in your kitchen. And uh, uh, if it can uh, receive microwaves and vibrate, then if it's vibrating, well, maybe it can kick out uh, uh, microwaves. And, and so if you think about it like this, is this would explain potentially, in the simplest sense, it may not be how it works, but in the simplest sense, you can believe that if it's a receiver, it could also be a transmitter, and that this could allow it to maze. And in fact, OH does uh, self-maze in the cosmos, and it's known to self-maze. So the concept came in my head that when we had this uh, uh, 10 yen coin, which is somewhere behind the <laughs> computer screen here, um, uh, that the, be, be, between the back of the plasma channel, there's like a plasma mirror and, and the metal, you ended up with a, an amazing action. And this burnt the hole through the uh, coin. And uh, potentially that caused a loss of mass. I have a video to share on that. What I've done is I actually, if I reach behind here, I bought uh, a whole bunch of uh, 10 yen coins. 
Uh, in fact, there are 10 in circulation coins in here, one out of circulation, so one that supposedly never was in circulation. And then we had our original one that uh, uh, was in my wallet and the one that got uh, toasted uh, on the day. But anyway, uh, it was interesting that I'd come up with a, a sort of concept. And then during the ICC of 2002, um, uh, uh, Stoyan was sharing at a, a dinner table and there was uh, um, uh, Mitchell Schwartz opposite. And uh, he, he brought out this picture and he was showing this picture where he was firing the HHO through into a cavity and it was producing this like beam in the center, almost like a laser. I said, well, Stoyan, that look, <laughs> Slobodan, that looks like it's, it's amazing again, um, like what may have happened with the coin. And <laughs> it was funny because uh, um, uh, Mitchell Schwartz was sitting there and uh, then <laughs> He gave his presentation about the fact that he had observed this amazing action. Um, and uh, so uh, I don't know what it, it was after that. He said that, uh, you know, maybe you're becoming a real scientist, Bob. Uh, and that, that meant a lot coming from uh, uh, Mitchell Schwartz. But, uh, yeah, so th this OH thing was very interesting with me. And also at the conference, there was a Mondainia, but sadly because of my condition there, I didn't get a chance to really speak to him. But reviewing his work... Um, uh, again, I saw that uh, he had observed uh, or, or claimed to have observed OH groups as well. So here you've got two people working with water, electrolyzing water, and observing the production of OH groups. And, and Mondini also speculated, you've got no sound. Ah, okay. Is, is, is no one got any sound? Because I need to start again. Uh, okay, it might be that I... Okay, let me see. Ah, uh, uh, can you hear it now? Can you hear it now? Oh, where's my microphone? Oh, dear. Is there no sound? <laughs> I'm going to have to start again. Sound is fine. Sound is okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So someone's got no sound. Danny, I don't know why you've got no sound. Um, the recording will be made uh, so you can hear it later. It should be coming from this Rode microphone. It's very, very unsensitive. So... Um, Maybe it's turned down. I don't know. It's actually quite high. So it should be working. Hello. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully you've got sound. Okay. Sound is perfect. Okay, Gary. Thank you. Uh, okay. So we've got three people with sound. Okay. So where was I? Um, Mondini had observed OH groups as well. And uh, his speculation was that uh, in the process of the uh, um, sort of plasma effect rather than the uh, just plain electrolyzing effect, um, there was production, production of deuterons. And he claimed that he saw uh, the emission frequency for that. Um, and and in, the, in, in that case, what you're doing is you're getting two protons uh, uh, and making that into a deuteron by electron capture, which necessarily requires a, a, a neutrino process. Uh, now, one would think it's on the outside, but it could be on the input if we believe the work of uh, um, uh, Alexander Parkamov here. And so... Um, it was very interesting to me that that he was also observing that. So I kind of put that out there, those connections. And thank, I, I cannot thank uh, Can enough for picking up the mantle on that. And he, he ran with that. Uh, and he was making really good progress, really fast. And so I thought it, it would be um, really good if he looked at the work of uh, the sadly departed uh, Yuji Bajatov and uh, um, Parkamov in, in their work um, that they did on this subject of using uh, electrodes in water and the, the subsequent patent that they produced. And uh, we've seen some wonderful um, uh, videos and uh, particularly the glowing blue ring um, from them. And at one point I asked him to put uh, potassium carbonate in as the electrodes and that's why I have bought this potassium carbonate here. Now I actually bought this deliberately I'll get the same focal plane. I bought this deliberately for testing in the Nova and Supernova. Sorry, it's always fast and I'm on a time timeline here. <laughs> Sorry. I, I bought this uh, potassium carbonate to test in the Supernova. And, and, and the reason is there's two elements in here that I'm very interested in. Um, uh, and, and, and that is uh, two elements, potassium and carbon. And it's not just any carbon I'm interested in. Now, at, at uh, Sochi, I, I advised the um, uh, the uh, researchers there that they really should be adding carbon. And it's not because of my speculation that niche energy was nickel, carbon, 
hydrogen energy, as in N, capital N, R, little I, capital C, capital H, energy. Um, I just thought, you know, Pintelli came up with that name. He did it for a reason because he doesn't do anything without a reason. And I made this speculation a very long time ago. But over the years, I found out that carbon is extremely ex important to this. And I've already talked about uh, um, that in in uh, a presentation on the Scarecrow show um, that uh, Mark Leclerc said that when you get over a certain percentage of carbon, uh, you need to have, I think it is more than 45%. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of threshold and then you start synthesizing the heavier elements. Um, uh, in the case of uh, Takaki Matsumoto, and I've shared this also before, this is his uh, Japanese edition of his uh, book on his papers. Thank you very much, uh, uh, show uh that that in 2002 i think it was in in a uh, editorial um in um or a letter to the editor in fusion technology uh or it was a criticism of someone else i think it was hal fox was making some comments on i think uh, about uh, ken shoulders evos and whilst uh, um uh, matsumoto conceded that he had basically replicated the work of ken shoulders with respect to evos he said that there is a situation where um, it doesn't matter what elements go in to uh, uh, one of these structures. What comes out uh, is more often than not carbon. And he showed these rings in his experiments. And here's a, a, a couple of examples like this. And they're, they're a very specific structure and they're, they're, they're forms. And he thought these were kind of explosion lines of quad neutrons. But he conceded it was a very many body effect that occurs in whatever causes this uh, uh, structure. And um, what I observed is you'll you'll know on that uh, uh, 10 yen coin, we observed a ring structure. And it's actually got a cavity be behind it. And uh, I, I will share all this data. But uh, on the rim, it's actually raised. There's a material deposited and it's carbon around this ring. So um, uh, that, that was very fascinating. Now, um, the reason I was asking people to put carbon in there uh, was when we ran the uh, NOVA in 2017, uh, Dr. George Eagley's NOVA in 2017 in Budapest, and we did the examination um, uh, from the testing that we did here in, in uh, Brno, um, we found that there were these elements, these George Oshawa uh, tree-type elements synthesized. But the question is, <laughs> is it just refining the um, material that's within the... Um, uh, the uh, charcoal, or is it um, just um, or it coming? The silicon maybe is coming from the quartz of, of the reaction vessel, or somehow it's just contamination and so forth. So I was racking my brains for an experiment that I could do that um, would be uh, uh, absolutely categorical that there was a uh, transmutation going on that could not come from uh, um, uh, some sort of concentration effect. And uh, what I came up with was largely down to what I had um, uh, concluded and tried to present in early 2017 in, uh, um, in um, uh, the uh, technical uh, university in, in uh, Mumbai. And that was that there, there was something that was able to get into the, to, to this structure uh, and it was able to be captured into this structure that was able to affect nuclear change. And uh, I could only conclude that it was neutrinos. Uh, and I have to confess that uh, um, how I was considering they were getting in there was because of uh, you exceeding the Planck's mass, which is 22 micrograms. It's not a lot of material uh, captured into a structure in, in, into effectively extremely small box and it was effectively acting as a, a, a micro black hole and it was continually being fed and so uh, that that concept allowed me to capture um neutrinos uh because they're affected by gravity and th 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 you know the flux is so immense of, of uh, neutrinos that you you know the cross section uh, on the the um the event horizon would constitute, in my opinion, a sufficient amount of neutrinos captured. At that time, to, to give uh, Alexander Parkamov credit, I, I hadn't, didn't know that there was a way to synthesize neutrinos and that there were neutrinos that would have a much larger wave function. Uh, it was uh, satisfying to see later down the line that um, uh, 
uh, Shishkin had observed that these rings, these actual rings themselves, uh, he calls them string vortex solitons, black evos that have kind of lost their, their br brightness. And you also see these things with Bogdanovich. Um, he he uh, established that these could really only be uh, condensed cold neutrinos, or at least that was one candidate for what was in them. And so, um, but the reason I, I was suggesting carbon uh, uh, and in, in the form of charcoal is because we didn't really see something quite so interesting when we use graphite. And I'm thinking, what is the difference between graphite and charcoal? What's the difference between graphite and charcoal? Well, graphite is dead because it's like, you know, there's a, a deposit here in a place called... Uh, 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 Chesky Krumlov, a uh, wonderful graphite deposit. But graphite has been like there underground for for millennia, millions and millions of years. Whereas uh, charcoal is 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 basically coming from a living organism. And and what's different about charcoal is that you have cosmic uh, um, uh, particles, uh, uh, um, like incredibly intense. Uh, 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 muons coming from, um, sorry, uh, protons and so on, come cosmic rays coming in. And, and they synthesize from ni nitrogen-14, carbon-14. Uh, and so uh, carbon-14 then is in the atmosphere, and then it gets breathed in by you and me, and it gets breathed in by plants, and we eat plants, or we eat the animals that eat the plants, uh, or the, the plant animals that eat the algae or whatever, and it becomes part of our body. And, and so charcoal uh, from, say, wood, um, actually contains one part per trillion of carbon-14. And this is one of the risks, in addition to the risks um, that um, uh, Shishkin has observed uh, or, or calculated, and, and, and he rates his uh, uh, 5,000 RPM um, uh, string vortex soluton generator cavitator, he, he rates that at being able to kill you within about one hour if you stand next to it. So, um, But he's talking about the number of greys that's able to destroy a red blood cell from the particles that are teleported from with, with these string vortex solitons, um, uh, a form of exotic vacuum object. Um, the, the particles that are able to teleport out of the metal structure and into uh, the X-ray and, and on the cellulose, uh, uh, celluloid and uh, actually leave these pits that are uh, corresponding to the mass of the nuclei that have been captured into the structure. Um, he's talking about the, when those are ejected, they have a, because of the depth and the width of the pit, he can calculate the energy that they have as they're expelled from the exotic vacuum object, and that this can therefore destroy red blood cells or it can cause damage to DNA in um, uh, white blood cells. I'm talking about a separate action, is that in your DNA, you have a sugar molecule uh, that holds everything together. And this has obviously carbon in it because it's biological carbon, it will have one part per trillion of carbon 14. This is a very big risk if you have the string vortex solitons coming out, strange radiation, whatever you like to call it, and it goes into your body uh, and uh, then it converts some of, it, it precipitates the decay of the carbon, uh, uh, sorry, the carbon-14 to nitrogen-14, therefore shredding your DNA. Now, small amount of exposure, you can overcome it because your body can do that. Um, but basically, you have um, this carbon, uh, charcoal, uh, is different from graphite. And so what I wanted to do um, is to test this in the uh, Nova generator, but then I was a little bit frightened because um, we found out that uh, in the early part of 2018 that the person that had made the Nova and the supernova uh, had contracted cancer. He was in his early 40s. He had two young children. And uh, I'd already done the experiment where we had created the George Oshawa uh, reaction products. And so it wasn't so interesting for me to repeat that because it's still not conclusive. But what I wanted to do is to put charcoal into the Nova or the supernova and run it and then send some before and some after off to a beam line where they're only looking for carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14, and to look at the relative proportions. Now, if it's an oxidation process that's refining the carbon out, if it's a uh, any other kind of process that's synthesizing, blah, 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 it, it, if there is a change from one part per trillion of carbon-14 uh, in this material um, down to another level, that's kind of... Uh, 
when 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 you do radiocarbon dating, it's that natural decay which takes five thousand. I think it's a. I've got I've got it up here. I think it's five thousand seven hundred years plus or minus two hundred uh, plus or minus forty years. Five thousand seven hundred and thirty plus or minus forty years. So this is how you find out how like some uh, mummy in a bog or some mammoth how old it is or how how old a deposit is with some you know shark's fin or whatever uh, some something like radiocarbon dating so this is a technique that can be used all over the world so i was proposing in 2017 to use the, to use this uh, um, but uh, sorry in 2018 but i had this kind of fear that you know um, the if it's for some reason, I, I needed to know, and it might have been because of this, that the emissions may be stimulated and uh, and you have this decay of carbon-14 uh, to nitrogen-14 and that this might have caused the cancer. And I was very shocked to hear that, that actually, uh, sadly, he died. And so um, that was that was a, a, a big shock. And so I, I didn't really want to do a test until I really knew what I, what I wanted to do. And and what I want to do is I want to run, um, and I have to give the supernova back. I, I basically run out of time on using that. So I, I have a very small window here. And I want to run some carbon um, uh, standard charcoal. And I've got a whole bunch of it here. I prepared it early in the year. Um, and some of it I took in this vessel and it's still sealed. And this ran for uh, 48 hours in the cesium chloride test in um, uh, Roisin Amaz's vibrator. And the reason I chose this is because if it is a, a string vortex solitons or, or some neutrino, uh, it's not going to be stopped by this steel con uh, container. And the char charcoal that is in here, the, the, the charcoal powder that's in here, um, if it is... Uh, Turns out that this is four years old charcoal, <laughs> and and this is a hundred thousand years old or ten thousand years old. Then what we have shown is that it is a hundred percent a neutrino process that must be doing this transmutation. Um, again, if we put these samples into the supernova, run it for three minutes or uh, or so, um, I'm told it needs at least around about three minutes to do something useful. Um, if this shows that this is, you know, thousands of years older than this, and it's only been three minutes in that uh, dusty plasma environment, then we know that uh, it is a, a neutrino process. We know we've not changed, we haven't got Betelgeuse lined up and lensing a load of uh, cold neutrinos at us. We must be synthesizing them in the cold plasma. Now we know that any kind of spark discharge or or uh, whatever uh, is uh, going to create exotic vacuum objects. And as Shoulders said, you know, when you have a plasma ball, those strands are effectively uh, um, electron clusters. And, and so uh, we are creating the environment. We already know from other videos of, of the supernova and the nova reactor that you do get these filamentary electron kind of uh, beams coming together. So th there is some electron clustering going on. And uh, moreover, there is a, it, it, when I was in Sochi, there was a um, presentation by uh, uh, Zatalepin. And he showed that in his uh, <clears throat> nickel uh, reactor that he modeled the nickel particles as little capacitors. Uh, and that uh, what happened was when you, you, you excite it, they, they charge up and they get over a threshold and then they do a discharge. And this could be happening because you've got uh, the RF and, and the interference inside the the um, uh, dusty plasma environment, and you get more charge on one side. And this was actually discussed by Dr. George Eagley. But actually, what I'm looking for is the discharge, and the discharge would synthesize EVOs. The EVOs would pinch down and, and produce an environment suitable for creating cold neutrinos. And so you'd end up with a, a, a situation where it, it could be that that's doing it, and hopefully this will be the test that uh, uh, allows that to happen. So that's one. Now, I don't know if you recall, but uh, again, th this was all part of O-Day, but uh, <laughs> in my presentation against my posters that I produced for ICCF 22, I was talking about the primordial uh, um, elements. And uh, essentially, um, I, I was uh, saying, you know, nature is 
you, you, what you've had is you've had the planet, let's say it's four and a half billion years old, and the crust has been exposed to piezoelectric effects. You know, you've got uh, silicon dioxide and it goes and you get these little uh, piezoelectric effects going on in the crust itself. Then you've got like water running down a stream and doing cavitation in a kind of way that you would get uh, in, in a Mars a vibrator plate. And then you've got lightning coming in and striking the ground. You've got a wide range of areas where you are going to be synthesized the environment to create exotic vacuum objects. And so um, uh, what I'm saying is that the, the natural abundance on Earth uh, um, uh, uh, could, could come about uh, by the fact that uh, there is some mixing of the nucleides going on. But whatever, whatever way you look at it, the primordial um, order in which the elements decay uh, are telling you something about their susceptibility to being transformed from one point to another, whatever is the reason. And uranium-235 is the most unstable uh, uh, primordial isotope. And so it, it's now, and, and because it's such a massive nuclei, um, you can gain a lot by fissioning it. So it was absolutely natural that you would do that. Um, uh, in fact, plutonium is even better, uh, plutonium-239, because whilst you can synthesize that from uranium uh, and you chuck a bunch of neutrons in it or whatever, um, the, the, the interesting thing about that is you gain just the kind of same type of energies, but its susceptibility is much, much lower because its half-life is only whatever it is, 237,000 years or something like that. But it, it big, that is a lot slower than uh, whatever it is. It's four point, where is it? The, 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 it's... Well, basically, the the half life for for uh, uranium two thirty five uh, is seven uh, times ten to the eight years, whereas the plutonium is two hundred thirty seven thousand years or whatever. So, if you imagine you're going to get say, the same kind of punch from plutonium as as you are from uranium, or give or take a, a chunk of energy, um, it, its susceptibility to falling apart is much much higher. So, the the yield from an event is is much higher. So. This is why plutonium is really a very nasty material, uh, and and you can see the logic behind making um, things that people don't want to be made from it. But if you look at the next isotope of the primordial isotopes that I had in my list on that sheet, uh, there is potassium forty, which is I think point zero one two percent or something point zero one one percent. It's a much higher than one part per trillion. Uh, uh, but its half-life is, uh, what is it, 1.25 times 10 to the 9. So it's 0 0.09 the length of the universe since the Big Bang, uh, whereas uranium-235 is 0 0.05 times the universe from the Big Bang. Uh, so basically, th what I'm saying is the reason I bought this in 2017 to test in the supernova is because it has potassium in there. And... Uh, it also has carbon, so potassium carbonate. And this, these two reasons, in fact, it's the same reason, I believe is why potassium carbonate is such a good Lena material. Potassium and carbon. Now, potassium, it's a much, much higher concentration of potassium than the, so, so it's, it's 0 0.014 or 0 0.012 or something percent of uh, potassium, total potassium. Uh, so it's one hundred. Let's say it's one one hundredth of a percent of uh, um, uh, normal potassium. Uh, whereas uh, uh, carbon is <laughs> it's it's uh, one, one part per trillion carbon fourteen. Um, also, the energy that comes from the beta that's emitted uh, from the predominant uh, decay path of potassium-40 is a very high energy beta. I think it's like 1.3, 1.5 MeV. It's a very, very high uh, energy. And this can cause cascade release of electrons. And isn't that a fantastic thing to have when you want to create EVOs? EVOs, as Shoulder said, get fed by electrons. And if you have something that's in situ, that can be caused to fall apart and create a whole bunch of electrons and stimulate the production of electrons that the EVO can then feed itself with, you've got a, a virtuous cycle. So the potassium is a stimulant and it's a food. Um, uh, and uh, carbon uh, 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 also. Now, the, the difference between these two is this has a much longer half-life, uh, uh, but, uh, 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 but it's a much higher concentration. 
Uh, this has a, a much shorter half-life, but a much lower concentration. And if you read and understand the work of Alexander Parkamov in this book and his uh, recent paper, it's about statistics. If you can create cold neutrinos that have uh, uh, a wave function that's in the microns to millimeters, it's actually interacting with trillions of atoms at the same time, tr trillions of atom nuclei. And if it can stimulate them to decay, and that they produce uh, an environment that's highly energetic, that then feeds the production of the uh, cold neutrinos, which then stimulates the decay. So it is no coincidence, it is no coincidence that saltpeter was used in, uh, and, and, and charcoal was used in uh, um, the alchemy. It's no coincidence. It's just what it is. <laughs> There is only one other, other element that's as unstable that from the primordial isotopes on Earth as the potassium-40, one element isotope, and that's uranium-235. So of all of the elements that could have possibly been used by the ancient people, potassium-40 in potassium is the single most productive, in my opinion, in this process. Carbon, in the form of charcoal, is what you also need. So... <laughs> This is not guesswork. It's not guesswork. It's just nature telling you what to do. Now, so I want to step back to where it was with uh, um, uh, uh, with um, how should we put this? Uh, there was a paper shared by um, uh, rather it was a transcript shared. So I'm, I'm changing tact here. So I, I've talked about uh, for those that missed it. Uh, potassium carbonate, why I bought this in 2017, uh, based on my understanding of no day, and why I have uh, uh, moved to charcoal, not graphite, uh, and why I want to run this in the reactor, why it was for two days in the Amasa vibrator, and why I want to test these on a beam line. And just to close that out, the reason you test on a beam line is that you're not looking at beta counts from a, from a sample. What you're looking for is the relative proportions of the isotopes 12, 13, and 14. And if in this uh, so source beforehand, it has a particular uh, uh, um, ratio, which should be the ratio you expect from something that's only a few years old at most. And then these samples run in a miles of vibrator and this one to be run in the uh, Nova reactors uh, have a different ratio. We have proved beyond reasonable doubt that uh, uh, neutrinos are playing a role in this process. Now, what form they are clustering into and, and taking and how they are synthesized is still open debate to debate, but uh, you could argue that that is uh, um, uh, what's going on there. So that's why I want to do that. Now, I want to talk about um, a paper that was, uh, sorry, tran transcript that was shared um, of a video that, um, Basically, when we were with, we were with uh, uh, Francesco Piantelli in January 2015, he gave us a DVD with a recording on there of, his, of uh, uh, Sergio Fugardi uh, talking about their work together, how they came about and so forth. And uh, when he passed, um, I, I published that uh, on the 25th of February 2016. Uh, on the MFMP's website. Uh, I didn't know someone had published it in sections beforehand. But anyway, um, that was transcribed by um, uh, Can uh, because, uh, you know, because he, I think he's Italian. But anyway, um, he tra transcribed that and he uh, posted that on Lena Forum. And then uh, uh, Alan Goldwater took that and translated that into uh, English. Uh, neutrinos do not interact with matter. Uh, the interaction cross section is four year <laughs> light years of lead. Okay, all right, but um, Axel, I seriously recommend you read this book. Um, it, uh, this may change your view, um, and uh, uh, if this this or this does yield results, um, then you've got to ask yourself what is doing it, <laughs> because you know <laughs> a beta decay a force beta decay doesn't happen doesn't won't change its half life without having something causing it to change its half life so anyway so going back to the um uh, Sergio Ficardi transcription um 
There's one point that I want to pull out here, and that is, well, together with p and we began this operation, load the hydrogen, the deuterium into the nickel. We build a small a box, we put the nickel in, and we begin to make tests, very empirical tests, and we find that when the nickel is around 300 to 400 degrees, it absorbs hydrogen considerably. This is something unknown in the scientific literature, as we later discovered, but we started with empiricists uh, in the work, and we found out later, talking blah, blah, blah. But basically, this 300 to 400 degrees centigrade um, uh, state. Now, why is this interesting? Well, firstly, um, I want you to think of what Rossi did in his uh, reactors, uh, his original ECATs. It is claimed that he used potassium carbonate in there and that that propagated through to Defcali and Green Technologies. If you look at the temperature at which potassium does things uh, itself uh, around the 300 and 400 degrees centigrade, I think you might find something interesting around that uh, domain and about the properties of potassium itself. Um, but also uh, um, it's got a low work function, uh, which means it's going to release electrons easily. Uh, but it is potassium, <laughs> and it has 0.012% or whatever it is, 0.011% of potassium-40. So that's that's one thing. Um, then I want you to think also about, also about all the electrolysis uh, experiments that, that did this. Now, I want to uh, just pull up a whole bunch of data points here. Um, so... Uh, so I'm, I'm saying here, I actually wrote this to Alan the other day. I said, I read with interest your machine-assisted translation of Ficardi's speech. Most notable was the temperature of 300 to 400 degrees C. Of course, this was the temperature that uh, Brulean Ele uh, uh, Energy Corporation reported the highest excess at ICCF 18. So I was sitting there, ICCF 18, and Brulean was showing this 300 to 4, and it was, I think it was about 300 and something, 303 degrees C, or what they, they got their highest excess. Well, this would be the temperature at which Ficardi is saying there is absorption into the nickel. I don't agree with Ficardi's uh, speculation that it's being absorbed. I do agree. I do agree that the hydrogen, hydrogen pressure goes down. We observed it ourselves in the glow stick tests. So what is happening? Well, I think there's already the answer out there. But before I come to that, I, I, I want to uh, step back a bit. So basically. Um, uh, that we observed this, Me356 observed in a reactor that he went to great lengths to show that it did not leak. He kept putting hydrogen in, it kept going to vacuum. It kept putting hydrogen in, kept going to vacuum. Where was the hydrogen going? And uh, so basically, um, uh, I think that the answer really uh, was already given in 1992, I think it was, uh, I just need to check on the date of this paper. Um, by Matsumoto. And so Matsumoto, he was a nuclear radiation nuclear engineer in uh, Sapporo. A lot of this stuff went on in Sapporo. Um, and I can't read the date because it's in, I think it's in 1992. But he actually took these pictures, which you can see here. Now, I've talked about these before, and these, uh, according to him, are frosts of hydrogen. Uh, they're crystals of uh, uh, dense hydrogen, uh, and he calls these, in this image, droplets. And you can see it in his papers. Like I say, I've shared this paper before uh, in another video. Um, but here's what I think is happening when uh, Ficardi is describing what he observed with Piantelli, which is actually just a pressure drop. So the hydrogen is going it somewhere. And we observe these with Chalani cells, you know, and around these kind of temperatures. And is it to do with the magnetic state of the nickel or the nickel uh, uh, copper system? Don't know. But anyway, um, at this point, uh, the pressure is going down. And um, what I'm suggesting is that the nickel catalytically is able to split the, the hydrogen at these kind of temperatures, and then the hydrogen with the excess electrons with the dendritic structures or with potassium in play is able to cause um, it, what, what uh, Matsumoto would call uh, itonic uh, uh, clusters. Um, and this is an incredibly stable form of material, which in, in fact is just a charge cluster. Is it an exotic vacuum object? Well, if an atom is a vacuum object, then something that's not normal matter, it would be exotic, wouldn't it? So um, is it? does it fall in that bracket? Maybe, maybe not. 
So, um, but the, the, the point being is that um, what we observed with our, uh, our Rossi uh, replication it, it, with his uh, pattern form is you had to heat it up very slowly. You had to do that with the Lion reactor. You had to treat that with, with a P and Telly work. I mean, this all goes back to P and Telly. You had to go through these very, when we had the, the, the signal, we had to go through these very specific temperature variations and we had these particular events occur. It may have actually been the pr pressure drop that was in the P and Telly reaction. Um, uh, but anyway, those, those, uh, um, those th this 300 to 400 degree temperature range is also where we saw our thermal neutrons being emitted in GS 5.3. So there is something very, very interesting going on at, at this stage. And I believe that uh, it's very likely that it is forming some form of dense hydrogen and the dense hydrogen uh, uh, itonic clusters that were identified, if I can find the picture here, um, we also observed th this uh, coming out of. So this is uh, Matsumoto's uh, itonic cluster uh, breaking down um, here. And that's kind of the trail of it coming in. And then you go, uh, we saw the same thing in a couple of spots on uh, the Amasa vibrator plates. So um, uh, essentially what I'm saying is that um, uh, there are a number of cases where this is observed. Now, it's not just there. You look at Holmlid's work. What is Holmlid using? Well, he has a, a potassium-based dehydrogenation catalyst. And I think if you, uh, you, I may be incorrect in this, but I believe that he's warming that up. I, I think someone needs to go back and look at his papers. But he's warming it up to around this 300 and 400 degrees temperature uh, range. And what we have is a huge number of um, data points lining up here which are pointing to this may be the temperatures at which the active structures are formed, that once they're formed, they seem to be very stable. You know, they're stable enough to live through the reaction and hang around and form frost and, and droplets later on. And uh, as Axel maybe observed when he looked at uh, the work of um, uh, uh, Me356, uh, that the, they seem to be transmuting material. And this was all defined by Matsumoto in the early 90s. He shows that the this type of hydrogen is able, uh, or this form or structure of hydrogen, however it's encapsulated, um, is stable, it can, it can transmute matter, uh, and he actually defined the ways that it eats out uh, crystal grains from material, makes material apparently disappear. Um, and how could you make a material disappear? Well, you could make it genuinely disappear, you could make it convert into light, uh, of some type, or you could maybe turn it into a gas that would then leak out and you wouldn't know that you were turning it into a gas, uh, but you kind of missed it and you, you weren't there ready to look for that gas, so you kind of missed it. So there's a range of things that you can do. Uh, and so, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to pause right now and just see if there are any questions on here, because I've got about another 15, 20 minutes to talk. Okay. Okay, black light energy, brilliant, et cetera. They're always on the verge of great things, but nothing substantive ever really happens. Of course, they're always looking for new investors. Um, well, primary research, it, you know, if you've got a business idea uh, and you go to the bank, they don't want to know unless it's basically finished, <laughs> right? The, 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 you, you've got to have something that's already, a product that's all ready to go and, and all the work's being done and then they'll invest with you to take some skim off the top. Um, if you're, uh, you know, trying to, uh, <laughs> investors don't want to know in primary research and, and a very wise, I think I've said this before, a very wise man told me once, uh, you know, a, a fool builds a business, a wise man uh, buys one and, and to buy a business, it's already got a, a successful track record and <laughs> the 99 businesses that failed before that business succeeded, you don't have to deal with. <laughs> so, you know, people will come and uh, come along and, and give you money when, when you, you know, so it, it's difficult. It's expensive. It's time consuming. Tell me about it. Um, so, you know, what I can say is that um, in, in in this book, uh, Alexander Parkamov uh, gives an explanation for why you see UV and soft X-rays in in um, uh, sonofusion in in uh, uh, in uh, brilliant light power um, in uh, a range of different, uh, in maybe in the ECAT SK um, and uh, in a range of different scenarios. 
and so um, uh, you, you, you know that the, they're all somewhere around the target. Um, and I think we really need to think about um, where uh, where where this is all heading. And this is this is why I'm taking a little retrospective and and, and looking out to to the future. Um, so the fact that mentions above is quite interesting. Yeah, the X17 particle. That's that's interesting. There's a lot uh, to you know look into there. I'm not so familiar with it. Um, uh, you can only do so much in a day, uh, and I think it's early doors on that. Anyway, it, it kind of almost sounds a bit close to uh, Bazatov's uh, uh, um, Erzion. I don't know. Uh, certainly. <laughs> There, 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 there was a scenario. I think I actually shared this video that I took at Sochi, and there is uh, Parkamov and, and Baranov and, and Zatalepin, and they're, they're standing there and they're, they're talking about the fact that uh, when they observed the Higgs boson, this itty little blip in the noise, uh, uh, and they all go, "Yay, we found the Hig Higgs boson." That in the same data, if you look out at exactly the mass of the uh, uh, um, Erzion that the Bajatov uh, found, um, there's this exact mass, extremely, extremely obvious signal. And it's a weakly interacting massive particle. And, and he says that this is the cause of Lena in, in his view. And, and, you know, maybe if you could understand it better, maybe it is. Or maybe it's a cluster of other structures. I, I, I don't know. So, okay, um, the fact that you was quite interesting. Uh, um, exotic vacuum objects were originally called uh, uh, electron validium or uh, because uh, something like that it's a latin for strong electron you might call it heavy electron um but uh, uh when he realized that it was able to take charged uh, take actually particles uh, uh, um, uh nuclei and move them from A to B, um, uh, he, you know, called it a charge cluster because it's got positive and, and negative charges in there. And then as he moved for, forward, uh, he called it exotic vacuum objects. And uh, because uh, he's basically saying that they're not electrons in their standard state, maybe, or that it's not just uh, um, uh, uh, protons and neutrons. And, you know, if the other kind of, <laughs> object out there is neutrino so if you've got a combination of all these threes you can't really a neutrino has no charge so you've got positive things you've got negative things those are charges and it's a cluster of charges but if you add neutrinos in there which are just don't have a charge you could argue that a, a neutron is just a, a proton electron held together by a neutrino uh, uh, or mass difference of a neutrino but you know if you look at this simple atomic model that they're, they're saying that and, I, and I've got a lot of sympathy for it that you, you've only got protons and electrons and and uh, something that binds them maybe um, uh, you, you something that's just <laughs> neutrinos in there which have been shown to be the case with the the nine-year work of Shishkin at, at uh, Dubna Science City this is the area where <laughs> a lot of the Soviet nuclear research goes on or the, the Russian nuclear research goes on uh, uh, they've, they've seen these string vortex solitons which can only really be accounted for by uh, um, uh, neutrinos so if you've got neutrinos in there um, then uh, you know, is it, is it, can you still call it a charge cluster? Because it's got neutral things in there. It's actually more than that. So it's actually a rearrangement of all of the types of matter into a kind of metastable structure um, that he called an exotic vacuum object. Now, if you, if you take EV and make those lowercase, you have E and then V, that, that could be electron neutrino object. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's to, just a bit of speculation that it might have been a, an Easter egg that uh, was left in there by by um, uh, by uh, shoulders that I that I've mulled over uh, in these past years. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I think there's no doubt that the neutrinos are involved. They have to be. If, if there's going to be neutrons going to protons, and protons going to neutrino uh, neutrons, there is neutrinos involved. So it, you can't say that they're not involved. Um, but what Parkamov shows in extreme detail uh, with extreme proof and extreme like uh, uh, um, me methodology uh, and everything matching up and consistent is that it has to be 
uh, 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 macro neutri neutrinos, which actually move very slowly. Now, uh, one thing he argues in the book, which is absolutely fascinating, is that it, it, you, he, he argues that, you know, um, uh, uh, nothing really can be synthesized below around about 1,000 degrees centigrade. But when you get to 1,000 degrees centigrade, this is in his papers, um, you get like something like 10% or something of electrons are sufficiently energetic enough to synthesize cold neutrinos. But when you get up to uh, 6,000 degrees, which is kind of like the tungsten sort of uh, hotness of a solid body, um, you are uh, getting 50% or something, a very much higher percentage able to synthesize the cold neutrinos. Uh, and these cold neutrinos, their velocity is way, way, way slower than the neutrinos that come out of a nuclear process. And um, these things can be produced because if you, let's say the surface of the sun, not, not the corona millions of degrees, but the surface, let's say 6,000 degrees or whatever it is, um, it's a lot colder anyway. It's still uh, because everything's held together, it's 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 a solid or a liquid that is it, this it, with these high electron densities, but it's at this high temperature, so it's able to synthesize vast numbers of these neutrinos, these cold neutrinos. And the interesting thing is, they don't have the velocity to escape the sun's gravity, so we don't see them. We don't see them. The ones that we see, and he, he details it all and it detected it are the ones that come from the cosmos. You know, the vanishingly small percent we get from the sun, the, the type of neutrinos we get from the sun, which need all these light years of lead, um, they're the ones that, that, that come from suns, uh, but they, they, you know, you kind of need a supernova, really, to generate these things, or or a big bang or something similar, because you need the, the bits that are creating them and the right temperature to be flying apart so there isn't the gravity to hold them back from traveling in, a, in any any other direction. And and so it kind of makes uh, a lot of sense when you know un understand what's going on. Okay, so... So absolutely not, uh, Axel. Evos are not only made of um, electrons. They can only be made of electrons. <laughs> that is one form of them. <laughs> but they're not exclusively made of electrons. Um, statistical analysis. Yeah, I mean, uh, Felix Schockerman's done some e excellent work. You know, he actually compared the geometry of. Uh, the um, the itonic clusters, as shown by uh, uh, Matsumoto, with the itonic cluster structures that we observed on the metal plates of uh, um, Roshina Maza, and found them to be essentially the same. Um, uh, and uh, you know, <clears throat> this statistical variation feeds into everything. And and Parkamov talks about flicker noise and and how like you can only have so much snow falling on a slope and and that snow, snow will come off, you know, but there are different modes in which it can come off. It's a wonderful explanation for, for the concept, and it, it really deals with his thinking. Um, yes, Axel, you're not talking about the same neutrinos. Please, 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 please. Even read Alexander Pokemon's papers to understand the difference. They're not the same neutrinos, okay? Um, they're not anywhere close to one MeV. <laughs> These are like 0.2 EV or something. They, you know, and and most of it comes from the actual mass. They actually have mass that, you know. These relativistic neutro neutrinos, they don't have mass. So the interaction is basically nil. Um, but it does interact, but it's it's, it's more like, um, uh, what do you call it, diffraction. Um, okay, so uh, there's, there's something else I wanted to come on to. And um, uh, it is, I'm going to go back to Can. And Can has been observing that, the, as, as with uh, Parkamov and Bajatov, they've observed a different... Uh, 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 situation where you, you make the anode the the actual uh, uh, um, the actual uh, electrode which is only a little bit in the water uh, and I uh, when he was speculating whether there was any transmutation I suggested that if there is any transmutation I would expect it to be 
uh, two oxygens going to silicon. And it's exactly the same logic that I was saying at ICCF22. Oh, and and basically, the, the reason is, is that a silicon, uh, uh, oxygen is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust by far. And then silicon is the second most abundant. But uh, oxygen-16 is the most uh, abundant isotope of oxygen. And silicon, I think is silicon-28, or whatever the most abundant isotope of silicon is, that is uh, the um, uh, second most abundant isotope of all isotopes. So oxygen-16, silicon, I think it's tw 28. Let me just confirm that. I don't want to get that wrong. Um, so if you go to fuzz, fizz dot org uh, and uh, uh, sorry. Ah. and you go to considered isotopes and you type in uh, silicon si uh, silicon yeah silicon 28 uh, is 92.21 percent of silicon and if you look at the amount of uh, uh, ratio of that in the um the the earth's crust you have oxygen 16, then silicon, 20, uh, uh, silicon uh, 28. So I speculated that your two oxygen 16s were going to fuse to uh, uh, silicon 28, and the balance is for helium. And lo and behold, if you look at all of the isotopes in the water, when you have hydrogen oxide, H2O, uh, uh, and you are able to do a two to two reaction, Two oxygen 16s, the first common isotope. So you've got deuterium is a non common isotope of water. You've got oxygen uh, uh, 17 and 18 are not common isotopes, very rare in normal oxygen. So it, when you get to the first fusion of uh, uh, or ch exchange reaction between oxygen and oxygen 16, you get four helium and silicon 28. So I predicted that silicon 28 would be the most common uh, synthesized element in there. And <laughs> That, that was that. And I, I put that out on ECAT World. And then um, Parkamov uh, said, you know, these, this work that, that Can's doing is very similar to work that I did in 2013. Someone had run him over and he broke his leg. And he went and worked with Yuzhi Bajatov at the Kirchatov Institute. Now, this is no fly by night institute. This is like one of the premier institutes in Russia in, in science, uh, the Kirchatov Institute. Go and look it up. And uh, they did a whole series of tests looking at uh, electrolysis under different modes uh, and with different uh, peaks. Now, I don't know whether I can share this. Can I share this on a, I don't know whether I can share it. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share you a paper um, uh, in the next day or two. And what I did, he, he sent me this paper. He said, I'm sorry it's in Russian, uh, uh, but you know this is, this is the report from our work. But um, what I did is I translated it. I sent it back to him. He said, thank you very much. And um, uh, he uh, said, that's OK. Uh, and he then translated the graph. So it's all translated. But the key thing that I wanted to share with you, a couple of the key things, is one, only when he was in pulsed mode, from, in, in every case he used, uh, apart from one, he used a 50 microfarad capacitor. I wish I know. I really wish I could share this. Maybe I can. I'm going to try and share this. Can I, can I share it? I want to share this picture. Um, how can I look? I'm gonna, I'm gonna dump. I'm, you know, I'm gonna print this paper right now. I'm gonna print this English translation of this paper right now. I'm gonna put it on our Google Drive, and I'm gonna share the link for you to all have a look at right now. And I've got now about 10, 15 minutes to discuss it. I wanted to make some videos about this, and um, you know, I've got, I've got other things to talk about. I want to talk about Pro Project Atomic Phoenix. What's doing with that Mizuno? These things are gonna have to occur at another day, but. Um, let me get this to you now. Uh, so I'm going to do file. Uh, ba -ba. Save. Save as PDF. Now I will probably update this. Okay. So just bear with me. This is real time. You're going to get this paper to look at for the first time. It's only been available in Russian and not well publicized. <clears throat> so I am going to go and put this in our directory here.
Okay. Okay, so I have it here and I'm gonna share it. Get a shareable link. Okay, here we go. I hope this works in the Hangout. So, are you ready? Boom, go and have a look at that link. I'll just test it works from here. Okay, yes, it works. Excellent. Okay. So, what he found was uh, that in the case where you have the electrode as the positive, i.e. The, the anode, uh, and you have it half a millimeter above the electro uh, 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 solution, uh, you create excess heat. In all other cases, you do not create excess heat. And this is in a pulsed mode. Um, so uh, uh, you basically charge up. So in every case, if you go to, I think, page, it's table two. I'm going to let you get, let, let you, can, can people say when they've got a hold of this uh, uh, PDF and they've got it on their screen? Um, has anyone has anyone got the the paper now? You're looking at it right now. Great, great, great. So we've got three three guys. I'm going to wait for some other people. There's a couple of things that I want you to look at. One is a new excellent, excellent. Five people have got it. So you're on fig one. Yeah, you're looking at fig one. Looks like it's six. Six people have got it. There's 22 of you in here. So I want a few more people to see this as I talk through it. Like I say, I've got about a 10, 15 minute window before I've got to go. The document arrived in Germany. Oh, <laughs> whatever that means. Is that the book or the... Oh, this link. Excellent. Okay, so I think a number of people have got it. So <clears throat> first thing I want you to look at down is at table two. Uh, that's on page nine. And uh, he basically had the electrons in various different configurations. And uh, uh, if you look at it, 50 microfarads is the capacitor uh, used, uh, capacitor, capacity, so the capacity of the, uh, of the uh, uh, capacitor um, in every case. And he describes in there that if you have it in a long discharge, it kind of basically um, does this kind of plasma effect that, that uh, uh, has been seen a lot by um, CAN. But if you look down the bottom, in the cases where it's discharging in an incredibly small period of time, um, you have these ma massive current uh, uh, discharges. And where this term of electro position, clearance, wh where he's positioning it, and it's all explained in the pa paper, He's got it half of a millim half a millimeter above the electrodes, the, the water surface with the electrolyte in it. And note that in the case where it's the highest, the highest excess heat is uh, the second from bottom, which is sodium carbonate. Now uh, that's got carbon in it, hasn't it? So and it's got a COP of uh, 1.4 to 3.9. And I think in their patent, they even report up to, I think, a COP of uh, seven or, or six, seven, something like that in their later testing. Uh, but here, here you see it's 1.4 to 3.9. In all other cases, the calorimeter is showing that it's, it's one or below, uh, essentially. Um, and in the case where it's down here, and he actually refers to the fact that uh, if you look at the text underneath, it says, a feature of this mode in which the excess of released heat over consumed electricity is detected is that it, the, in this case, the maximum current density is reached of the order of 100,000 amps per centimeter squared. All other modes provide a significantly lower current density. I note that it is precisely this high current density that distinguishes the experiments of Bajatov 6-7 uh, Velokodny, 15, Aroitskev, uh, Adamenko, and Vychev, who uh, observed anomalously large heat releases and other phenomena characteristics of cold nuclear transmutation. So uh, th there, we, there we go. Um, <clears throat> uh, so he's talking about new atomic energy sources, transmutation of matter, the reproduction of scientific... Yeah, okay. 
So basically, in this paper, you actually have the how to generate excess heat. And the, the other point I want you to bring you to is down to table three. And this is where they're looking at the, the elements in solution and the elements in sediment. Now, if you go to, um, uh, I will try and share these links because I've already done the calculations. Uh, when I got this paper, I simply could not believe it when I ran the calculations uh, uh, in um, uh, the two to two calculations. So let me find those calculations and I will be with you shortly. Okay. So here, here is the, is it this one? I need to go to the results on this. Okay, I'm gonna share a link with you right now. Uh, So here's a link, and these are reactions calculated. And what I've done is I've put in uh, protium, deuterium, tritium, oxygen. Oh, no, no, it's not that one. I've got the wrong one. <laughs> uh, I have put in there as the reactants in the 2 to 2 reaction table, uh, protium, deuterium, potassium, carbon, oxygen, iron. Uh, as the two molecules uh, elements that go in. And if you run yourself down the E1 and E2 lines, down, 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 uh, all of the uh, element isotopes are cut, rare isotopes of carbon or oxygen or deuterium and so on. The first time you get common isotopes is how, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, something like 14 lines down. Uh, it's got its reaction ID 2900 in the left hand column and it's oxygen 16, which is a boson, which is necessary and ideal to go into the exotic vacuum object. And then a boson, which is oxygen 16 going in. And what you get out of it is uh, silicon 28. And uh, where is it? Uh, yeah. Am I looking at fusion? Oh, this is a fusion line. <laughs> So yeah, so you get a fusion of uh, oxygen 16. So sorry, that's the silicon 32. So I, I, that's actually the wrong reaction. <laughs> I'm trying to give you the two to two reactions. So bear with me. Uh, am I in the two to two now? Yes, I am. Okay, execute query. Uh, oxygen 16. Okay, so this this is the one I want you for. What one? It's the the basic two to two reaction. So this is the link you want. Sorry about the previous one. There we go. So in this, I think it's reaction number eight one seven three seven. It's the first time in of all these products that you have uh, two common isotopes that are in the water or in the reaction matrix that was done by both Parkamov and by um, uh, me 356, not me 356, <laughs> can. Um, oxygen 16 plus oxygen 16, both bosons, release is a helium 4 and a silicon 28 and 9.59 mega electron volts. Okay, so I, I predicted just off the top of my head and knowing that nature shows us on Earth the most abundant isotopes are oxygen 16 followed by silicon 28. So what do we also know that nature likes to produce helium? Because if you look at the atomic chart, that's the biggest gain you can possibly get for packing nucleons into a small space uh, when you're looking at elements either side of helium-4. And so um, when you are trying to do a, a two to two reaction, helium-4 is a really good product to produce. It's gonna give you large amounts of uh, nuclear levels of energy in a, a two to two reaction scenario. And so putting your oxygen 16, oxygen 16, the very first most common thing that can be produced because that's most of the atoms in play produces helium-4 and it produces uh, silicon-28. Now, if we go back to the paper that I've just shared with you, table three, and it says, large production of silicon in the sediment. Wow, okay? 
Uh, and then secondly, uh, calcium. Now, we know because we've observed massive, massive, massive production of calcium from a Mars uh, uh, blowtorch going on to tungsten. So in this experiment, he is using molybdenum. Why? Because it's a very high temperature. Why? Because that allows you to get to a high temperature in the plasma discharge, which allows you to get into a situation where the electrons in that material are still in a high dense state so that you can synthesize cold neutrinos. But it also causes the fissioning of the uh, molybdenum. And I bet my bottom dollar when I saw that, that that calcium would be coming from the molybdenum uh, fissioning. So you have fusion in the form of, well, actually tra uh, transmutation in the form of two to two reaction, uh, oxygen, oxygen going to uh, um, uh, four helium and silicon 28 uh, and uh, proven by four and a half billion years of Earth's natural processes. And then you also have oxygen 16, oxygen 16 going to si silicon 32, which is also silicon. So there's no surprise that you're seeing silicon there um, in either of those two scenarios. But if we go to the reaction where you are involving molybdenum, and I've already done that for you, um, you, and I've done it here, so I'm just going to execute that query and give you the link. And in this scenario, uh, you won't believe it, but the very, very top output of this reaction produces calcium. And in fact, a vast number of all of the reactions produce calcium and also many of the other elements you're, you're seeing there. So I will give you this link in just getting it for you to go away. Uh, okay, so there you go. So if you look at that link, uh, you will see that you are uh, at taking the molybdenum that he's put in there and you take the top line right there where you, you have a neutrino coming in on the right of the equation uh, the first reaction that doesn't require a neutrino is 5319. It's about 10 lines down, something like that. And uh, that's uh, deuterium. So you need deuterium, which you didn't have. So you've got to count those out. So the first reaction that just involves protium and molybdenum produces calcium 48 and chromium 53. And it produces 20 uh, mega electron volts. So already you've got a reaction that's like twice as energetic than the uh, fusion or or, uh, or the so the two to two reaction that we saw producing silicon twenty eight and helium, um, uh, the fusion reaction between oxygen sixteen and oxygen sixteen where's that that produces silicon thirty two and that's sixteen mega electron volts sixteen point five, but what if we put in tungsten? Well, you know what what would we see with tungsten uh, if we put that in there? Get ready, guys. Right. Yeah. Okay. Awesome minute. I got eight minutes <laughs> before I'm kicked out. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to execute this query for you and I'm going to send it to you. Uh, Mm -hmm. Anyone got any questions on what I've just been talking about? Okay. Should have this link for you. Right, I've got the link for you. So in this case, we're looking at the case of water. <clears throat> uh, so just proteum and molybdenum, nickel, oxygen, and tungsten. These are all the elements that are in the... Uh, actually, I'm going to take molybdenum out because uh, we, we're not interested in that because I've, what I've done is I've, I'm assuming we're going to do the Parkamov experiment, but we're going to replace the molybdenum uh, electrode with a tungsten electrode. And I'm going to execute that query and give you the results. And here it is. So we've got proteum with tungsten. So this is proteum with tungsten. And we are seeing there uh, that you are getting 
106 mega electron volts from the fissioning or the two to two reaction of uh, with protium and tungsten 180 going in and uh, uh, iron 57 and tin 124. Now, this is absolutely amazing because you've got iron 57. If that is genuinely coming out there, we can use nuclear magnetic resonance uh, to be able to detect uh, that, that we are doing this fissioning. So what I would pr pr propose is that you look at the paper that I've shared in this uh, uh, video chat where uh, Alexander Parkamov working with Yuzhi ba the sadly deceased Yuzhi Bajatov at uh, Kurchatov Institute in Moscow. Uh, found that in all modes of discharge and uh, position of electrodes and, and polarity of electrodes, it was only those where you had the, um, the, the anode in the center with the ring cathode and the electrolyte with the, um, uh, the electrode just half a millimeter above the surface and you did a pulsed discharge. So you, you, he, I think he describes using a mercury switch and so he charges the capacitor up to capacity and then he discharges instantaneously. Capacitor up to the capacity, discharges instantaneously. And then rather than using sodium, he's got right with the sodium carbonate. I would suggest adding in potassium carbonate, this stuff, potassium carbonate. That's why I asked uh, Can to put in potassium carbonate because we have potassium 40 in here, the second most unstable primordial isotope and carbon, which has, uh, hopefully if this was synthesized using charcoal um, uh, or carbon from uh, uh, hydrocarbon sources, maybe, but charcoal would be better, fresh. Um, uh, potash would be best, just like the alchemists used, right? Get some potash. <laughs> um, but you, you have carbon, which is one part per trillion, but it's only 5,700 plus or minus 30, 5,720 plus or minus 30. So it's very susceptible to uh, uh, cold neutrinos. Potassium-40, very susceptible to cold neutrinos, but it's uh, got, so it's less susceptible, but it's a much higher concentration. So the combination of these two is absolutely wonderful. And then use a tungsten electrode. Now, the, 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 risk, the problem with the tungsten, as we've shown when we did the Mars gas testing, is that the, the, the production, and, and when I share these images with you, they are absolutely, completely breathtaking. You have a plasmoid that's run a large length down the uh, tungsten electrode, the thoriated tungsten electrode, and it synthesized calcium, and presumably the, the sister product is xenon. But the calcium, the atomic volume of the calcium is even one calcium atom, is so much bigger than the, than the tungsten atom that it smashes open as, as millions of atoms simultaneously convert to uh, calcium from tungsten, they create these spheres and the spheres smash open the surface. And so what's happening when you've got that tungsten electrode and it's going to produce this energetic effect with this strike, you've got these incredible 100,000 amp amps per whatever, uh, whatever uh, Parkhamov talks about in that pa paper. It produces the exotic vacuum objects. The exotic vacuum objects lead to your, your uh, uh, and the electron density and electron temperatures lead to the production of the, the cold neutrinos. But whatever, what we do know for certain is when we're putting the, the, the gas, uh, the Mars gas on there, which we know has atomic hydrogen in it, and it may be in this form, which is uh, uh, shown here, uh, uh, which some might call, uh, you know, ultra dense hydrogen or whatever, but it's very stable. So it can able, may be able to be stored in the gas for an extremely long time. Um, when, it, when it comes to doing its work, uh, it's causing the fissioning of that tungsten and it's smashing that apart. So your electrode isn't dissolving in the electrolyte. It, it isn't electrolyzing. You know, it's not being acid etched. It's not electrolyzing away. It's being blown apart by the nuclear reactions. But isn't this a wonderful proof? So what I'm giving you here is a, 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 a thing where we can take... Uh, so uh, we, we can take a couple of things. <clears throat> look at the Parkamov paper. Look at what you, him and Yuzhi Bajatov established, that when you have the electrode above and you do pulse discharges and very high current uh, densities, uh, which all of the other researchers that have seen massive transmutation have done, that is when you see excess heat. Using potassium carbonate that was meant to be in the original ECAT in Def Kelly and Green Technologies in so many experiments, and potash was in alchemy. So particularly, it needs to be a carbon which is charcoal. So it's got the uh, carbon-14 in there. 
Um, and you use your tungsten electrode. It's the heaviest element you're going to be able to get very easily. Uh, and the great thing is it's got a um, good electrical conductivity uh, and you can make it into a very fine point. It's high temperature and blah, blah, blah. So I hope, I hope what I've done here has given people some uh, uh, insight into where my thinking has been over the last couple of years and uh, how things tie together. There's a lot more to this story. With, with receiving the, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, BN2000, the Browns gas generator, it looks like we should be able to get that up and running. It's going to take quite some time, some investment. There's some very competent people involved. Uh, we want to bring some more competent people involved. We are going to need some money to do that. Um, uh, and th that's going to be a, a big story. We need to test to see if there was chrome bearing steel because chrome will lead to uh, a, a chrome a hexachromate. Um, and this is something that I will talk about a lot more going forward. There's something very important about that in itself. Um, but the, there's a specific risk uh, which some apparently some uh, HHO uh, uh, people working with HHO got cancers because it's incredibly bad carcinogen. So we need to get some water testing kit, test it to see if it's chrome. If it's just mild steel and it's got no chrome in there, then then we're good to go and get it up and running. Otherwise, we need to really think about uh, how how we handle the device. Uh, so I've probably got about two minutes. Uh, so if there's any questions, I'm just going to run down. Okay, I'm going to have to go. So uh, thank you for your time. Please look at the paper that I've just shared from Alexander Parkamov. I'll share it through the usual channels. And uh, I will see you in the next uh, video. If you've got any questions also, you want to go to ECAT World or go to the Atomic Phoenix uh, blog on uh, um, the MFMP uh, 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 quantumheat.org. Uh, I may be able to discuss it there. Um, so thank you very, very much for your time. And let's look forward to... Uh, what's going to happen in uh, the next year, 2020. I think really we're getting to the bottom of, of what, what is going on in this process. Thank you very much for your time. Yep.